yes, they do have a certain amount of patriotism, but they also have a lot of cynicism and they sort of assume the government actually is lying to them throughout this period. Welcome to Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm Terry Finneman, and I research media coverage of women in politics. And I'm Ken Ward, and I research the journalism history of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. And together, we're professional media historians guiding you through our own drafts of history. Transcripts of the show are available online at journalism-history.org slash podcast. Truth be told, I've never been that interested in East Coast journalism in the post-World War II period. The idea of these reporters parroting the distortions and outright lies of public officials in this fight against communism just kind of put me off, and so I stayed away from it. Of course, that was a pretty dumb decision. I knew from my own research how bold many journalists had been in questioning it, and in some cases, journalists were even refuting those public officials. But I assumed that what I knew to be true about reporters in, say, the Midwest just wasn't so in Washington, and that the reporters there really were just cartoonish dupes. And that's why I'm so thankful that I came across the research of Catherine McGar, an assistant professor of journalism and mass comm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And her book, which is titled City of Newsmen, Public Lies and Professional Secrets in Cold War Washington. In today's conversation, Catherine takes a hammer to this simplistic view of Washington journalism in the 40s and 50s, showing that the era's reporters were keenly aware of what they were doing, which should maybe raise even more red flags for historians than that old model for the era. Catherine, welcome to the show. So, uh, I get the. I always love research that seems to be kind of a turns out, right? Like we've been thinking it was this way, but turns out everybody, we we were a little bit off here. And I I got that sense from your book, right? Um, in particular, you're kind of pointing out this misconception that we have about what this kind of foreign policy journalism in Washington looked like and what those journalists were doing. So why don't you help us understand what is the conventional view of this Washington press corps during the period that's the greatest focus of your book, the 40s and the 50s? Great. Well, I think that the most common view is that this was a press corps that were basically stenographers for the U.S. government and that they were working hand in glove with the government and that they really bought into the Cold War as an idea. They were very anti-communist and that they sort of sort of helped propagate that view throughout the country. Um, and I think that that's sort of the, the view that we've had of this, of this foreign pol policy press. So what then do you think, you know, briefly, we'll get into all of the details, but what did we get wrong, right? So if they weren't like this league of, I don't know, anti-communist mouthpieces for public officials, like what, what were they? They were primarily internationalists. They um, were supporters of the Atlantic Alliance. They had um, fought or worked in some way in World War II. And so, you know, we have the story that, well, World War II changed everything and World War II made, um, you know, everyone a, a patriot and suddenly, you know, America is always in the right. And I argue that, yes, World War II did change um, a lot for these men. They're living in a nuclear world. Um, it's much more dangerous. Um, and, and yes, they do have a certain amount of patriotism, but they also have a lot of cynicism and they sort of assume the government actually is lying to them, um, throughout this, throughout this period. Well, that's interesting because, uh, under that conventional view, then we would assume that if they know that they're, or if they think they're being lied to and they're repeating that, that they, they know that they're complicit in something. And you're, you're saying quite clearly, no, that's at least not their intent during this time, right? It's not their intent, but they, I think that they actually are complicit. And I think the story has been maybe that they were too naive to really know they were being complicit. They didn't really know the government was lying mm. to them. And uh, what I'm trying to say is, no, they're very complicit and they see themselves in that way. They see themselves as activist journalists on behalf of an international community and the Atlantic Alliance. And in this period, that primarily means supporting the Marshall Plan for European recovery and supporting NATO. Um, Rearming Western Europe was really important to this core group of foreign policy reporters. And in my book, I talk a lot about the fact that all of these reporters were uh, white and they were male, the ones at least that get included 
in this foreign policy press corps. And that was by design. They were making sure that anyone who did not share their view of the world was not able to come to these meetings, was not able to get hired into these positions. And so that's why it seems like there is this Cold War consensus, um, because we do have the same stories coming out in newspapers all across the country. And again, that is by design, and they're working hard um, to make sure that sort of their view, this this uh, you know European centric sort of white internationalist view, is dominating. Okay, sure. Now, in your book, you talk about a lot of um, institutions and forces that lead this press corps to think similarly on this, especially with issues um, and sort of the tone toward internationalism. Um, You talk about these socio-professional ties, like these societies in D.C. and other places. How influential were these societies? What, What societies are we talking about here? Yeah, this was some of the most fun I had doing my research was looking at all of these clubs. And so there's men's clubs in Washington, like the Metropolitan Club, which aren't strictly for journalists, but journalists belong, some of the elite journalists belong. And I also looked a lot at the Gridiron Club, which um, it still exists, but at the time it was um, all, all men, all white. It was sort of the 50 most elite Washington journalists, you know, selected by themselves. And they would meet um, at the time twice a year and put on these um, skits and, and song parodies. And it was white tie and tails and it was a stag event. It was sort of a must attend event because the president was there and you know, every Supreme Court justice and all of the important ambassadors and the whole cabinet. Um, so it was a really important event in Washington. And it's just one of these many spaces um, that, and then also just, you know, the National Press Club bar on a day-to-day basis, overseas writers, um, which, you know, hasn't really been written about before. Right. These these spaces just um, cr- help journalists create a way to have a private conversation within Washington Um to figure out what sort of the story will be. What is going to be the story of the Cold War? And can we all, um, you know, make jokes about the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan behind closed doors? Um, And can we sort of acknowledge these realities of, you know, the fact that our uh, closest allies, France and Britain, are still colonialists? And we supposedly came out for self-determination, um, for all nations during World War II, and yet we really don't want to abandon France and Britain, sort of acknowledging this hypocrisy, again, in private, and then not acknowledging it um, outright in, in writing. Um, and so these spaces just are important because they're, they're private spaces, and yet they're professional spaces. Well, what about, uh, you mentioned earlier, the shared experience of World War II, and how we may not properly understand exactly you know, how that impacted the era that you're talking about. But in your book, you, you mentioned it, that time, that kind of shared time under fire, especially in places like London during the Blitz, had a significant impact on those shared relationships among journalists as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I was tracing a friendship network, um, partially, of this this cohort of reporters who sort of, you know, came of journalism age uh, during the war, and then they were the bulk of that State Department diplomatic press corps um, in the 40s and 50s. And some of them were working in government, some of them were reporting on the war, but all of them were going through these really difficult periods where they were away from their families for a long time. Maybe they were at the front. You mentioned London. That was a very common posting. Um, it, was, it was where you know the Allies were running their, their war effort um, out of London and Washington. So that's where a lot of these guys ended up. Um, and it was just a time where they were, for, just like everyone else um, participating in the war, they were also forming these very intense friendships. And they were doing it primarily in these homosocial spaces. And they carried that, those both those really close friendships and the you know, sort of normalization of the homosocial spaces back with them to Washington and to their jobs after the war. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. And just as kind of an aside, I want to continue with this narrative. But I, in my own research, I really find network analysis interesting and kind of an unused tool. You mentioned that you were researching these friendship networks among these journalists. How did, in a practical way, how did you go about doing that type of research and and sensing, trying to get a sense of these these networks of friends? So I, you know, I started um, in New York at the New York Public Library with the New York Times's internal papers, and I was interested in the Washington Bureau, and you know, I saw all this correspondence with 
Scotty Rustin, who was um, the Washington bureau chief and a diplomatic reporter for the period that I look at. And so I decided to follow Rustin to his archives at the University of Illinois. And then I see who he is corresponding with. And I go, you know, follow that thread to Turner Catledge's um, papers in Mississippi. So I felt like I was sort of, you know, literally tracing um, these these correspondence networks and friendship networks. And then also just paying attention um, when I find out, you know, little connections, like the fact that um, Rustin and another one of the diplomatic reporters I follow, Wally Duell, they'd been on the same ocean crossing sort of early on in the war. And this had huh. been, you know, a time where they kind of bonded. And just imagining, you know, being for that period of time, like in that kind of closed space, just sort of helped me get a better understanding of, of um, every, everything we don't see in the newspapers, sure. um, all these friendships that we don't see. And then, of course, you know, when Rustin writes this book during the war, Artillery of the Press, and uh, Duel reviews it for the New York Times and, you know, doesn't disclose. And by the way, you know, this is one of my friends and he went to school with my sister in <laughs> Illinois and um, none of that. Um, and so, you know, they're they're just swimming in conflicts of interest. And so they don't really see them as as conflicts of interest in the same way. It's just they are they are all friends. Um, yes, they are somewhat competitors, but it's not like there are um, you know, national newspapers in the same way that there are today. You know, there's no national edition of the New York Times. Um, so the wire reporters are gonna be in competition with each other. Like the AP and the UP guy aren't gonna share. Um, you know, their their resources, mm -hmm. but almost everyone else, they're not in direct competition. And it sort of allows for a lot of collaboration and, and friendliness. Interesting. A, a minute ago, you mentioned that, you know, speaking of closed spaces, one of the things you mentioned, in addition to those um, societies, the professional organizations, the shared time under fire, you also focused on exclusive access as something that, um, kind of uh, uh, put walls around the people, not only the people who knew certain types of information, but also the way that they treated that information when it came to these private, uh, not not even press conferences, but conversations mm -hmm. that select journalists would have with leaders um, and the creation of you know you, what you call the Lindley rule, things like that. Yeah. How influential were those in creating this culture and this this attitude they had? I think they were hugely important. I think that this rise of the the background session culture, which you know is still one of the ways that uh, reporting operates today, of course, people want information on background. it's It's the way you can do your job. Um, and i and I realized that that really started in earnest during the war. And it started because um, the government and the press were constantly in tension over what could be released to the public and what couldn't be. Um, and there were certain people in the government that were fighting with the press more than others. And at one point, a group of men got together with Admiral Ernest King, um, who was sort of running the Navy's war efforts, and had this private off-the-record dinner with him. And all of a sudden, all of these guys are on King's side. And they're willing to, you know, plant stories that sort of, you know, play up the the good feelings between the army and the navy because there had been all these stories about how, you know, they weren't getting along and, you know, our our war efforts going to fail. Um, and so, you know, there are these specific stories where I, I, you know, I can you can see, okay, they attended this dinner, they write this story, they don't say where they got their information, they don't, you know, say that they had a private dinner with King. Um, and these dinners became so important that at the end of the war, um, this big group of reporters who'd been sort of cycling in and out, and again, they were only inviting other white men to cycle in and out with them, even though there's plenty of reporters of color in Washington, there's plenty of female reporters in Washington, um, uh -huh. and they're still making sure it's just them. So they have this big <laughs> banquet um, at the end of the war, and they they call it they call themselves the Veterans of the Battle of Virginia. Um, because that was where they were waging their battle was these background sessions in in the <laughs> suburbs of Washington, um, and they just thought they were so cute. Um, and you know, sometimes they are. Like sometimes I I do appreciate um, getting to see like the the cutesy little menus they come up with for these um, dinners. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but also they're very self congratulatory, and it's a system that you know again never made it into the public understanding um, of of the period. Sure. You know, one of these groups that I had no 
idea about before I was reading your book. And I, I, I'm still trying to sense if I just, it was a blind spot for me or if, you know, I think you mentioned already that there's just not been a whole lot of research done on them is the overseas writers. Yeah. Can you explain to me what those overseas, what, what that group was? Yes. And I had never heard of them either before doing this project. That so, makes me feel better. Yeah, Good. <laughs> um, because they don't write, they didn't write about themselves at all. And it wasn't, so the overseas press club might be the one people have heard of, the one I had heard of based in New York. Um, This was, you know, totally off the record, totally background. It was a group of reporters who got together after World War I um, and said, we need some sort of organization in Washington for reporters who have reported overseas and then come home. And, uh, you know, just a way to sort of to keep up that network. And we can invite speakers and have luncheons. And, you know, they had just been reporting in Europe for a few years on the war. And they they sort of saw this as a way to return the hospitality when there were foreign dignitaries visiting or foreign journalists visiting. So it was a sort of a small group um, it grew in the 30s, and then it just really exploded in the 40s because so many reporters were suddenly um, considered overseas reporters. You know, even if you just sort of go to Europe once um, during the war or go anywhere and you come back, you're eligible for membership in this overseas writers group. And one of the changes that they make after the war to make this group more useful is they say, um, we are going to have you know different levels of membership. And you can only be a real member and come to our off the record and background lunches with important people if you are an American reporter writing for an American news outlet and you live in Washington, D.C. So, you know, you might have a membership if you work in New York and you sometimes, um, you know, pop down to D.C. Um, you might have a membership if you work for one of the European papers. But they said we're going to make this a really useful group, and we're going to have um, you know we're going to have in Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, to talk um, you know off the record about the coups that the CIA is planning um, all around <laughs> the world, and you know they're they're talking about these things um, pretty frankly behind the scenes. So frankly, in fact, that some of these notes that reporters were taking from overseas writers' meeting end up in CIA files. Um, as the CIA's records of these meetings. And the CIA has, you know, redacted them for their files, even though, you know, 30 journalists just heard exactly what they said. Um, Uh And so the the journalists are are hearing the real, you know, first draft of history, and then they're writing something different. Um, And they, you know, they acknowledge this, they're, they're really just trying to do their jobs and keep their jobs and keep their access. Um, and one of my favorite letters I came across was from um, Joseph Harsh, who was a diplomatic reporter for the Christian Science Monitor, and he was also on CBS radio. Um, and he writes this uh, famous historian at Columbia, and he says, if I wrote what I really thought, I wouldn't have any readers. He's like, if I, he's like, sometimes what the real story is goes against what he called the current of American folklore. And so American folklore being sort of, you know, America is this democracy and, um, you know, we've got civil rights here and we promote them abroad and we're, you know, we're only out for the good of our people and other people. And that's the American folklore. And he says, you know, I, I can't, I can't write that because, um, because I would have no readers if I did that. And so they, they know they're being hypocritical. And they sort of feel like they have no other option in this period when World War III is looming over them at every moment. Well, so that's a that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to to ask you about next, which is, you know, we've been talking about the kind of what uh, what spread this sense of responsibility and and contained it within these these social organizations, the professional ties. But what was that responsibility? They have this overwhelming sense of responsibility. What are the forces behind it? What is driving them to report in the way that they are? What are they afraid of? Yeah, I mean, I think they have a, a valid fear of nuclear war. And if not nuclear war, then World War III. Um, you know, maybe I think we sometimes forget, or maybe we don't because we're historians, but I think that sometimes <laughs> people forget Um World War II came so closely on the heels of World War I. And, you know, almost everyone who was alive during World War II had also been alive during World War I. Um, you know, some of these guys were kids, but 
it came very soon after. And so there was an expectation that, well, maybe World War III is going to come just as quickly after World War II. So they don't know what's going to happen. And so I think they do have, you know, sort of a, a valid a valid fear of, of nuclear holocaust. And I think it's it's not a fear of communism. And they talk very frankly about the fact that, oh, don't worry, no one in Washington really believes that this is about communism. You know, this is about balance of power. Um, this is about Russia. We don't, it, it would be the same, you know, there's this one letter where a reporter says it'd be the same um, if it was a, a Russian czar um, or if it were the communists. You know, this is really just about keeping keeping the balance of power in Europe and throughout the world. Um, and so they, they've got these these really justified fears um, based on their experience with the 20th century about what could happen next. Sure. I, you know what, I, I can't remember who it was in your book that, um, that you, you quoted, but somebody used the term waging peace and that seemed to really represent kind of the way they, they saw their role in all of this and what journalism and at least some cases ought to be. Definitely. Um, I think everyone talked about waging peace, you know, like that was sort of the party line. I think, um, you know, our po- politicians also were talking about um, waging peace. And so because of that, they were able to say, well, um, maybe we're still in a kind of war. And so it's okay, even though we know it's wrong from a journalism ethics standpoint, maybe we'll try to help out the government a little more. But the thing is, they do know it's wrong. Um, one of my favorite incidents is when the Marshall Plan wants Turner Catledge, who's at the New York Times in the New York office, um, to come, you know, to be a PR person for them for a little while. Um, I think over in the in the Paris office, and he doesn't want to go. And the publisher wants him to go so badly. This is Arthur Hayes Sulzberger. Publisher wants him to go so badly. He says, "I will make up the difference in your salary for the period you're gone. Like, not only will I give you a leave <laughs> of absence to go do this." but I will make sure that I make up your salary. And Turner Cowell says, no, I really don't want to do it. Please make my excuses to Paul Hoffman, who's the Marshall Plan guy, um, and tell him that I can't do it. And so instead of Sulzberger saying, you know, we need Catledge here or or the truth, um, you know, that the Catledge didn't want to leave the Times, he says, you know, we really shouldn't have a New York Times newspaper man be part of a propaganda agency. Even though we really do believe in your propaganda, we just think it would not be ethical, you know, from a journalism standpoint to have one of our guys come work for you, even though he had just been lobbying um, for Catledge to do just <laughs> that. And of course, they got a different reporter to join them. They got someone from the Christian Science Monitor. Um but yeah, they so they sort of knew where the lines were, and they knew as they were crossing them, and they you know they didn't have some idea that like objectivity was was the end all be all of of journalism. Um, they were they were pretty more they were more realistic than that. Um, I think sometimes we condescend to this era of journalists a little bit, and we you know somehow think they're more naive or stupider than like all the journalists that came after them. Um, but they weren't. They knew what was going on. Sure. Uh, we can certainly see parts of this culture still in journalism today, but I, I don't think uh, you would argue that things are still this way, right? So what has changed? Like, What led to a breakdown of this era of such close cooperation and towing the line for in the 40s and 50s? So I think the breakdown um, in the government press relations started in the, in the 50s. Um, I think that the Eisenhower administration was particularly tough on reporters. Um, it was especially hard because um, they didn't trust um, John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State, and his brother Alan Dulles, who was head of the CIA. And they were running, as they, you know, as we've discussed, like all these covert operations um, instead of outright war. It was more common in this period for these these covert operations. Um, and that put reporters in a really tricky spot, and it meant that the government was was often lying to them, which they knew, and then they would go lie to their readers. Um, and so it was just it was already there was already a breakdown um, in in the fifties, and then there also was sort of I guess a breakdown in in trust among journalists more in the sixties and seventies, and this is something that you know Michael Shudson writes about, where you've got this sort of rise of the critical culture, where where suddenly 
reporters are critiquing other reporters in public and in print, whereas before they would have been doing it behind the scenes. Um, not early 20, early 20th century, you know, there's plenty of press criticism. But in the period I look at, there's not a lot of public press criticism. Um, you know, there's very few people standing out there on their own. Someone like I.F. Stone is one of the exceptions. He's very willing to criticize the press. And he is, you know, kicked out of the National Press Club. And he's blackballed from overseas writers. And he, you know, can't get into these places. Um, and then, and that changes in the in the 60s and 70s. And suddenly we get all these journalism reviews, you know, the the Columbia Journalism Review, these all get founded and, and suddenly there's a lot more press criticism going on. And I think a little bit of a breakdown of community and trust. And then I also think that this community just became more, more open uh, to women, to reporters of color. And sometimes when these men who've been trying to keep those other groups out of their clubs for so long do let them into the clubs, the clubs themselves then, be, then become less important spaces. So, you know, no, no one thinks the same way of the National Press Club today as they would have in the 1950s. It's it's not that same really important um, social networking space that it used to be. And so some of those places um, lost their importance. And then there was also just a new generation that came into journalism that had not been a part of World War II and did not think that World War III um, was about to happen and felt like they were safer to air their criticism in print instead of just, you know, complaining, complaining behind the audience's back, which is what my guys do. Sure. Well, we're running short on time now, but I want to make sure we have time to, to ask this one last question, something that we ask all of our guests on the show. Catherine, why does journalism history matter? Yes. And I don't know what I can add because all your guests have um, such fantastic answers and I feel like you've covered a lot of the ground. <laughs> um, but it's important because, you know, journalism is the way we learn about the world and we need to understand, you know, how how it happens and, and how that sausage gets made and what's behind the, the printed word so that we actually understand um, our present day and our, our history. Sure. Well, Catherine, I just want to say I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it, too. Well, that's it for this episode. Again, the book is City of Newsmen, Public Lies and Professional Secrets in Cold War Washington. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at jhistoryjournal. That's all one word. Until next time, I'm your host, Ken Ward, signing off with the words of Edward R. Murrow. Good night and good luck. Good luck.